So I guess the main thing to talk about with episode three is Bo-Katan. Um, so oh, what course. do you guys think about that? I've been searching for more of our kind. Well, lucky we found you first. I've been quested to deliver this child. I was hoping that... You do not cover your face. You are not Mandalorian. He's one of them. Dink Ferrick. One of what? I am Bo-Katan of Clan Kreese. I was born on Mandalore and fought in the Purge. I am the last of my line. I think the hardest thing about Bo-Katan is that we haven't seen her <clears throat> in like two decades. You know, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened to her. And so it's kind of hard because like we're attached to this character from the Clone Wars and, and you know, from Rebels. But at the same time, um, she's really just a lot like Luke right in, in the when we sh he shows up in the last jedi they're not the same person as they were the last time we saw them mm -hmm. and so i think her character feels appropriately older and a little bit weary i think mm -hmm. which is interesting but i think she still has the same the same spirit and of course the casting is perfect. Yeah. So that was really nice. <laughs> well, you know, the casting is the voice actor. Yeah. From right. Clone exactly. Wars and Rebels, which I love yeah. because, like, she deserves that part, of course. She oh, yeah. knows the character and she looks perfect for the character. I think they modeled her in Clone Wars after what she actually looked like. They must I have. I think they did that with a lot of yeah. the a lot of the animation in Clone Wars with the voice Which is actors. Awesome. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the good casting and I enjoyed the kind of like the tension between Mando and her, like when they first meet, he, he's like kind of like upset at her because like she doesn't follow like the, the, the helmet rule. Mm -hmm. And then like she saves him, I think. And then and then she's like, okay, well at least talk. And then they, they start. And then I, I like how they eventually get to sort of like a friendly relationship that like mm -hmm. starts off walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I got the impression that she's kind of over people like him in a way like she's kind of over the religious zealots and the different people who are like this is how you are a true mandalorian right because at one point she was ruling mandalore and mm -hmm. so it's kind of fun to see how she sort of just dismisses him as a cultist so to and speak at one point she was part of death watch mm -hmm. also so she knows pretty much the ins and outs of everything that's mandalore <laughs> Right. It, I think it's also interesting to see how Din doesn't know anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he knows only like the things of his cult and nothing else. And I'm I really enjoy seeing him learn about more of what the history of Mandalore because he doesn't know anything. He didn't we saw in season one he didn't know about the history with the Jedi. Mm -hmm. and now we see that he doesn't even know that there's other Mandalorians that take their helmets off which is mm -hmm. because he was a foundling and then the Great Purge happened so it was probably just bad timing for everything <laughs> yeah I think one of the things that is really interesting about that is that like Din's ignorance obviously serves a narrative purpose so that like things are explained to the audience but it also in a world building way is an extension of the ignorance that is just pervasive throughout the galaxy. You know, of course, we as the audience almost have a curse of knowledge because we are like, how would you not know that Jedi were real, right? Like, yeah. like tw <laughs> 20 years later, Han Solo, you're telling me you don't believe in the Force. <clears throat> but it's true, right? Because we're used to seeing people flash around laser swords on, on screen, but no one saw that happen, right? Of the quadrillions of people, Nobody saw a Jedi unless you lived in like Coruscant or one was directly sent to your planet and you happen to run into one, right? When, when little Anakin Skywalker says no one can kill a Jedi, he probably was not the only person who believed that. And it probably wasn't just nine-year-olds either. Mm -hmm. And then you see by the original trilogy, of course, everyone's getting to the point where they're like, mm, Jedis are kind of a myth, but okay. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, really? You're telling me they can move things with their mind? Show me, right? Give me proof. Because obviously they get wiped out for the most part. Right. And so you just kind of see them when they, they're no longer part of society as they were. Mm -hmm. It's just people just forget about it because they forget history or think it's a myth. 
And mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to see that continued on now because this is set right after the original trilogy. So it's, it's good to see that continuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely like that they went for like a nobody character with Bando. Um, I don't know, like, instead of, like, like I'm glad they didn't make him, like, Boba Fett's son or something like, like that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, that would have been too much by, a, by yeah. a mile. Yeah, I think a lot of people like that the Mandalorian is something that's not big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we like the, the mentions of the big characters coming in for this and that to tell the story that's going on, but it still revolves around this guy who's just kind of there. He was a foundling. He knows some things. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's awesome to see. Uh, they take over the Imperial ship, which is which is a pretty cool like action sequence. And then like the, the Dark Saber name drop, even, even though we already saw it. Mm -hmm. And then like finally the um uh, we get the Ahsoka name drop. Where can I find the Jedi? Take the foundling to the city of Kaladin on the forest planet of Corvus. There you'll find Ahsoka Tano. Tell her you were sent by Bo-Katan. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of the real questions, I don't know if this is too obvious of a transition into the next episode, but yeah. <clears throat> one of my biggest questions is when this takes place relative to the finale of Rebels. As for me... I used to think that Ezra was counting on me to protect Lothal, the planet and the people he cared for so much. But one day, I realized there was more to it. There was something else I was meant to do. Ezra's out there somewhere, and it's time to bring him home. Because I heard some theories on that with the timeline of the episode with Ahsoka falling right before the finale of Rebels. So mm -hmm. she would have... Obviously, in the next episode, she gets the information about Thrawn to go back to Sabine and be like, this is where we're going. That would be interesting. Yeah. I, I think, think that's just a big lead into an Ahsoka show, though. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Of course. I think... I think Dave Filoni was like, he was kind of like shaking on it. He said like this, or it was one of the John Favreau and Dave Filoni. One of them said something about like how this might take place after the Mandalorian, um, but like not giving it a definitive. Like like they they, they want to kind of like do whatever is like convenient. Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think they also don't want to give away anything about the Ahsoka show, right? Yeah. They can't because if it takes place beforehand, mm -hmm. Ahsoka can't die. Yes, but Ahsoka is so. I, I think, think her that, species they age well enough that she could still be alive. I think they live so, to be like two hundred. I think. Yeah, uh, she. I think what was it? Shock T. I forget how old she was, but yeah, I'm just saying she'd be she'd be in like her seventies, right? I mean, they'd be. Yeah. So I think it's like one of those things where if Ahsoka was alive during the sequels, there's no good reason for her not to have shown up, right? Theoretically. Well, we see in the last movie when all the Force Ghost voices that we hear. Yeah, there's actually she's one of them. Yeah, that's true. Implying she is dead by them. These are your final steps, Ray. Rise and take them. Ray. 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 Bring back the balance, Ray, as I did. In the night, find the light, Ray. Good luck, Lord, Ray. Good. Never take it. Every Jedi who ever lived lives in you. The Force surrounds you, Ray. Let it guide you. Feel the force flowing through you, Ray. Let it lift you. Rise, Ray. We stand behind you, Ray. Ray. Rise in the force. In the heart of a Jedi lies her strength. Rise, rise. Ray, the force will be with you. Always. With those movies, it's up in the air for what they're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Hear me out. We already have, based off of Rebels, a way to change time. We so can the just... Mandalorian. <laughs> yeah, just have the Mandalorian <laughs> retcon the sequels. I don't actually want to do that, but I do think it's funny that there it, it is 
theoretically possible within canon. I just, one of the things that I like about Star Wars is that they don't, they try really hard not to retcon things. They're not Marvel, right? Where they're like, did that happen, right? You know, <laughs> especially in the comics where it just changes every five years as to what the canon is. I think it's nice that we don't have to play around with that too much with only one split, you know? Yeah, and like they, in Mandalorian, they, they, re- they reference like every single thing, which is like, they even reference like the holiday special. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that, that was, that's great. So I what just, did y'all think about the tooth thing? The what thing? When the when the guy bites down and he just dies. Oh, that was pretty dark. I was like, oh man, I think my my little brother watches this show. I think that's a little dark. For me. <laughs> no, I mean it's you know obviously a, a high tech version of a little cyanide pill, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it it was interesting to see the dedication, right? Yeah, that they had. Yeah, it's it's in service of like the dark saber and Moff Gideon are like so important. To them that like i will literally kill myself to to protect them yeah it's an, it's interesting to see that in a star wars way because obviously you see his face get like electrocuted mm-hmm. so it's cool to see that in the star wars way <laughs> yeah thanks so much for watching please subscribe if you like the video my next video is going to be something of a special video i'm going to be interviewing the Doctor Who composer Dominic Glynn, who wrote the Colin Baker Doctor Who theme music and the incidental music for Colin Baker and Sylvester McCoy. So that'll be exciting. Look out for that. Thanks again for watching. I hope to see you next time. Stay shway.